everybody. Thanks for tuning into Border City Rock Talk, where you get the best interviews with the best interviewees, with sometimes a comedic touch. I've got one of the Canadian legends on my show today, and I'm so stoked to have him. But before I introduce him, um, I will just say this. Well, actually, I'm just going to start off with this. Uh, this uh, his name is Randy. He's famous for I Love L.A. How are you doing, Randy? You got the wrong Randy. What? I love Winnipeg. Oh, okay, I've got Bachman. I'm just bugging. Yeah, right on. How are you doing, my friend? Good. You're uh, speaking I'm of gonna Winnipeg? I'm going to hang up, and you're going to go call Randy Newman now, right? Well, you give me his digits, I certainly will, but I wanted you on my show for the long, longest time. I said to a friend last night, she said, how did you get uh, an icon like that? And I said, well, I coined the phrase uh, persistence but not insistence. So, I mean, I've been trying to get it for about three years, but I've been patient and I'm very happy to have you. Um, everybody knows uh, you for a BTO, which is uh, Canada's equivalent to ELO and UFO, um, No Sugar Tonight, American Woman, Hey You, Prairie Town. Uh, I, I can't uh, name all the songs that you're famous for because we'd run out of time. I will say one thing, though. I'm not sure if you're aware, I did some research because Taking Care of Business is one of the most famous songs worldwide, played at every wedding. It doesn't matter if you're in Toronto, Winnipeg, uh, Yugoslavia, or Taipei. Um, I came across the Psychology uh, Journal of Atlantic Medicine. I think it's on the East Coast of the USA. It says, for some reason, uh, divorce rates are higher when Taking Care of Business is played. Um, what are your thoughts on that? You think there's any correlation? Well, the, the divorce is really taking care of business. It's the the guy getting the uh, the the woman gets the gold mine and the guy gets the shaft. That's the taking care of business there of divorce. <laughs> okay. So, anyways, um, let's talk about uh, a few things. First of all, um, vinyl tap, which um, unfortunately the CBC or cor not course CBC, and they decided to stop running it after what 16 years. Uh, they did that what 2022, 2021. Yeah, I don't know why they would do that, but um, you brought it back. And for the people that don't know vinyl tap, um, just give us a brief or not us, I understand, but. The people that maybe have not listened to it it's a radio show where you talk about stories you play music um and where is it going to be appearing on what stations coming up i started touring when i was in my late teens and i've almost played with everybody in the rock and roll pop music dance whatever festivals and clubs and so when i do the radio show i have a theme the, the songs might be girls names it might be summer songs, it might be biking songs, driving songs, songs about love, songs about breaking up, whatever. So there's a theme there. So it allows me to play music from four or five decades. Like if the girl's name playing Diana by, you know, Paul Anka from the 50s, and I'm playing something brand new by, you know, Lady Gaga, which is another name. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it's my own personal stories of meeting Whoever, Jimmy Page, Robert Plant, Brian Wilson, my own story that nobody knows because it's only me meeting them backstage in Michigan in, you know, 1985 or something like that. And it's my own story of being in the dressing room with them or being backstage. And I asked them how they write a song or what did they do that. And so why not that was basically my own story. So it's like you're sitting beside me on the tour bus or you have a backstage pass, or you're a fly on the wall and I'm talking to these people. So that's what Vinyl Tap is, and it started out as a joke for a summer replacement at CBC, and then it went on for 15 years. And I love doing it because it's just like I'm talking to you now, that's what the show is, there's no script. I just got a 26 songs, which fit into two hours, play them in order like it's a set, like I'm on stage, like a fast one, a medium one, a slow one, fast one, and I talk about the songs, and then I play the songs. Um, and so... Would you be having um, coming up? Um, you started, uh, you restarted this, relaunched it uh, just last month. Um, are you going to be having any um, guests on the show that uh, you want to know? Okay, so um, have you prepared in advance themes or do you do that ad lib the day before sort of thing? No, no, you got to prepare it. I mean, I, yeah, to do a two hour show, I go through maybe 150 songs. People send me ideas. Why don't you do a song about? 
a show about flying. Like an Air Canada guy said, why don't you do a song about flying? And I said, name more than six songs. He couldn't. I'm just leaving on a jet plane, big old jet airliner, just like very few songs. So I did trains and boats and planes. So then you could do a train song, you know, leave it on a jet plane, you throw mama from the train. You can, you can expand on that. So um, yeah. I plan them quite a bit ahead of time. I maybe I've got 10 shows in the can right now, nice. which we play every Sunday night. They're on course on uh, rock network right across Canada, yeah. a lot of rock stations and um, Sunday night at seven o'clock. And uh, because I'm going on the road in about two weeks, I'm doing yeah. my own tour of the prairies, Winnipeg, Regina, Saskatoon, Alberta, where I play my own 12 or 15 hit songs and tell how I wrote These Eyes Are Undone or American Woman or Taking Care of Business. And then yeah. I play them with my band. My son Tal is there. He tells how he wrote his songs, Aeroplane, The She's So High, and stuff like that. And it's kind of a sit down show where we're talking to the audience, which is nice because the audiences are smaller now because of the mandates and restrictions. So we're playing casinos and, and theaters. At, but I haven't played with my band for like two and a half years now since shutdown. So I'm getting, I'm really getting excited to get out there and play again, hang out with the guys like in the tour bus and play some music and see the people. Do you have any plans uh, for going across further than the prairies uh, in the future? To do what? Going further than the prairies coming out east uh, across in, Ontario. In July, I'm playing with Burton Cummings, it's Backman Cummings, and that's an incredible show. It's about 30 songs. <coughs> from <coughs> all the guess who hits all the bto hits the burton solo and the my solo and we've got a big um six uh, album and six cd box set coming out of back when cummings the history the historic songs so i'm not even sure what it's called and uh playing in um all in july around toronto molson's amphitheater i know it's called not called molson's anymore but yeah. that's what i call it playing peterborough toronto uh, a big festival in Quebec and a couple other places in Ontario. I've got four or five or six dates. So are you flying in or are you doing the tour bus thing, like you said, just for the... Well, you fly into the first gig. Yeah. You fly into Peterborough. You yeah. go in reverse for a day. You do a sound check and then you, you're on tour. You're 30, on tour. 30 songs. Is that it? You can't be talking in the one set. Yeah, we did this in Winnipeg. On the, the long September, September long weekend, like last September. It would have to be long. It was supposed to be Winnipeg's 150th birthday and Manitoba's 150th, except it was a year late because of the COVID. Yeah. We went there last September. I think we did 28 or 29 songs. It took two and a half hours. Oh. We, we played it outdoors at the ballpark where they normally would have 18,000 people. But because of the mandate, they only let in 6,000. Mm -hmm. But it was really great to see... 6,000 Winnipegers there and it being our hometown and playing all those songs that basically were planted and grew and became the acorns were planted became oaks around the world they became worldwide hits so actually that was kind of unique of a kind of a link you played kind of a most most uh shows are 12 to 15 songs with an encore so you played double you played in a baseball stadium so it's kind of a double header yeah sorts that's the show we'll be doing this summer the back and coming show so in peterborough is it a festival because i, I i've been i've been uh you know looking at your website and everything and um the tour list things but I, I i saw the peterborough name but i didn't really see so what is it a festival i don't know i just i'm like you i get a name i fly there i play the gig I leave. <laughs> you're like me yeah i haven't got any calls for gigs lately but i mean i'm open for offers yeah <laughs> Well, people will realize that in between gigs, you're unemployed. You sit at home waiting for the phone to ring. Your manager, agent calls you and say, hey, you want to go here for this much money? You go, yeah, I've got nothing to do. Then you're employed. Well, and the, and the problem with the last couple of years is not just like somebody like yourself, as you set yourself up. But I mean, you've got, um, uh, there's mouths to feed through you for your um, your employees. Um, I've, you got know. Over, I've got over 20 employees. Yeah, and so it was. It's probably been well. Probably is an understatement. It's been hard for those people that your techs and stuff for the last two years. But uh, so speaking of techs, um, I understand that. Uh, well, everybody that uh, you know uses social media has had to see in the headline about your guitar being reunited. Um, tell us about that and uh, what's going on with that after four decades. I believe you lost. Well, when everything shut down. Um, 
my daughter-in-law Coco, who set this up for you. She's Japanese. Actually, uh, speaking of Coco, thank you, Coco, but also thank you, Ariana, who uh, was working with, uh, and I'm very appreciative to both of them. So shout out to Coco and Ariana. Coco is makeup and hairdresser. She was doing a movie in Victoria. Right. And she came and she said, we all got let go. We got some pay, but I've got all these sound guys and camera guys. They want to keep doing stuff. Why don't you and Tal start doing YouTubes? I just said, I don't want to get into that. She said, oh, just get some guitars and goof around like Wayne's World. You don't need to, you don't need to rehearse. I said, great. No rehearsal, that's me. Yeah. So Tal and I got together and we did one YouTube and the response to it was so great. We called it a train wreck because he showed up with five songs that I'd never played in my life. I showed up at five, he'd never played. We knew them because you hear them on the radio. But yep. to sit down and play Bohemian Rhapsody or something, it takes a little bit of effort and the chords and everything or whatever songs. Yeah. So he would surprise me with five or six songs. I would surprise him with five or six. And we didn't know what we were doing. And we were starting the wrong key and played the wrong chords and singing the wrong lyrics and correct each other. And I said, after the first one, I never want to do that again. It was embarrassing, like playing naked on camera. And we yeah. got so many emails saying, we love this. We love to see you guys, like us, making mistakes. With everything we hear on the radio, yeah. we know you've sung 30 times. You know you played your solo 12 times. You've taken the best licks and put them together. And all we hear is your greatest stuff on the radio. To see you actually stumbling and making mistakes like we make at home, we sit there with our guitars and sit there and laugh and change keys. When you can't hit the high note, you change the key and then you, you sing the song again. Yeah. And so we did that for over a year. But in the middle of all that, we got an, um, when you're doing a YouTube down the side of your screen is like a black little band and people can write in comments, a good song or fast song or whatever. Yeah. The guy wrote in, um, I found your lost guitar. And my Gretsch guitar was stolen in 1977 from a Holiday Inn in Toronto. Wow. That's why I say to tell, let's get a hold of this guy. We get a hold of him and he's found my stolen Gretsch guitar that was stolen 50 years ago. He found it in Tokyo. So out of this, doing this YouTube kind of thing, wow. my guitar I've been searching for for 50 years. It's a 1957 Gretsch 6120 guitar. So the guys in Tokyo, this guy in White Rock who found it, took my video with BTO of looking out for number one, where I'm playing the orange guitar. Yeah. And he, he Googled every orange guitar sold in the world, if you can imagine that, in the last 15 years and pulled them up because they all came up on his computer. So he had a frozen picture of me and he kept pulling up this other, and then he found this guitar of mine with a guy named Takeshi in Tokyo. So he sends us this guy's website, the guy's singing rock around the Christmas tree in Japanese, even though he, and in English, even though he doesn't speak English, he's singing it phonetically. He's kind of like a Brian Setzer. He's playing my Gretsch, which is a real good rockabilly guitar. Yes. And I see him singing and it's my guitar. So because Coco is Japanese, she contacts him sets us up a Zoom, he brings the guitar on camera. I go crazy, it's my guitar. And he says, I feel I was born to look after your guitar and keep it, and I will give it back to you. And I go, what? Because he bought it from a vintage dealer in Tokyo. Wow. And he says, but you must find its sister. I, want, I don't want a new Gretsch. I want an old Gretsch, like this, 1957 Gretsch with no mods, no repairs, it's gotta be perfect. It's gotta be 9.9 .9 out of 10. Yeah. I go, are you kidding? You want me to find a guitar from 1957 that's as good as mine, that what you've got, that has no mods and no repairs? And they only made 45 in that year, so I've gotta go and find another one that's in good shape that somebody hasn't put on Gibson humbuckers or done something stupid to it. Yeah. And he said, yes, I will do that. So we get off the Zoom. I, I go to all my Gretsch guitar buddies because I've been collecting Gretsches for years and I find one. And when I get it here to me, it is three serial numbers away from mine. So it's made in the same week, in the same bench with the same guides. It's a 1957. I show it to Takeshi on a Zoom. He says, yes, I will trade you that guitar. So we've been waiting now for over a year to go and do that guitar trade because of the travel restrictions. Even now there's travel restrictions to Japan, but the Canadian consulate got involved, whose name is Ian McKay, the guy from Penticton, speaks Japanese. He contacts me and he says, why don't you come here and do the trade on Canada Day? So this Canada Day, July the 1st, this is all being filmed, by the way, for network, Netflix or, or, to another, or HBO or some other 
to, it's being a rockumentary of how this guitar magically came back to me from a guy who had nothing better to do because he was stuck in his basement. Looked up the word Gretsch. He didn't even know what the word Gretsch meant. He knew I, my Gretsch was stolen. He didn't even know how to spell it. And he explained this in the documentary. So he spells the word Gretsch. It comes up. He sees me playing the Gretsch guitar. He finds Takeshi playing it. Now this evolved to me going to Japan. We talk to Japan every couple of days now. So this is being done through the Japanese consulate, the Canadian consulate, at the actual consulate where the guy lives. The uh, the Canadian theaters there, the Oscar Peterson theaters there holds 280 people. We're going to go on stage there. I'm going to be playing, maybe taking care of business with the band. Takeshi will walk out with my guitar, which I haven't seen for 50 years. He'll hand me mine. I'll hand him the sister guitar. And we'll finish playing TCB together on camera. I will be very emotional because I haven't seen or played this guitar in 50 years and trading him the sister back. So I feel like I have a, a brother, a guitar brother who I've never met, who I can't speak to. He doesn't speak English. I don't speak Japanese. We always have to have Coco in between translating. And I'm going to, and, and I've got the sister guitar, the twin guitar. I'm going to give to him and he's going to give me back mine. And that'll be the end of the documentary, us playing together. So you said he spoke English earlier, but he sang English, but he doesn't understand. Technically, I'm, I'm, Tal and I did an album in uh, June of July of last year, which now because of the interest in Japan, Coco is teaching me, and I'm doing it today and tomorrow, to phonetically sing two of my songs, translate them into Japanese. So when we go to Japan, I actually sing, Konnichiwa, wa, wa, da, da, da. I'm singing in, and it's very hard to translate a song from here into Japanese because they have different idioms, yeah. different slang, because all the rock and roll songs are all slang. Let it ride, take care of it. That's all little things that we say. It's not normal. Yeah. Normally, it's just taking care of busyness. See what I mean? That kind yeah. of thing. So um, I've translated them all. Eric was helping me sing it phonetically. And Takeshi sings phonetically. So he'll probably sing TCB phonetically. Mm -hmm. I'll sing one of his songs one night. He's had a lot of hit songs in Japan. Mm. And he's kind of like the Brian Setzer of Japan, a real cool rockabilly guy. And um, that's kind of what we're doing. Until I have the album come out, the album will be part of the soundtrack to the guitar documentary, which came up out of the blue because after we finished our album, we hadn't done uh, YouTubes for like six weeks. We were in the state of Washington recording in the studio. Right. And uh, Coco said to me, all, all the fans want another YouTube. Why don't you do one? I said, I. I'm not ready. We just got home. She said, why don't you just get a guitar? So I got the orange guitar. Do you want to hang on? I'll get the orange guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man. That's great. Holy jeez. It looks like uh, Mr. Bachman's been... Uh, oh, he's, uh, he's looking great. So I get this guitar. Now, isn't that a beauty? Isn't that a beauty? I mean, you bring up Brian Setzer a lot, and I got to tell you, um, I'm into the Harvey, the Randy Rhodes, the Van Halen style, but I love Brian Setzer. I think he's one of the most, well, I don't think he's underrated, but I mean, he's just a talent for sure. Right? Well, I bring in this guitar and I tell the story of it being lost and being found, and she puts it on YouTube. Right. We get a call the same day, the next day, uh, to come into BCTV in Victoria. They want to put this YouTube story on the national news at six o'clock. Oh. Six o'clock news, which is nine o'clock in Toronto. Yeah. Then Toronto calls and says, we want to put it on our 11 o'clock news right across Canada. Nationally, uh -huh. I go, are you kidding? I just, I, you know, held up the guitar, told the story how it was stolen and how I'm getting it back. Wow. Um, and then it goes viral. It goes viral. It gets translated into Spanish. It goes to 150 million people. Yeah. It goes to Sweden and Greek. And I'm saying, why does anybody care about me getting my guitar back? And everybody said, and I was on Good Morning America and, and all kind of other real legit TV shows. Like mine. People are so tired <laughs> of getting up every day and getting bad news and then bad news and then worse news and then bad news and more bad news and excuses and lies from the government about yes. those and the mandates. Out. This is like a feel-good story. This is people doing random acts of kindness. Yeah. All you're losing, we found your guitar. We don't want nothing for it. Connect with this guy. Then I connect with the guy and he says, I will give you back your guitar. Do you know what a deal that is for me to get my guitar back? Oh, yeah. And then Air Canada calls and says, okay, we love the story. We'll fly you to Tokyo. Don't worry about it. Holy jeez. You know what I mean? So these people are calling and doing random. And then this guy calls from LA and says, 
We want to do a Netflix documentary on it. It's just touching many, many people. Everybody in the world has a guitar. I know someone with a guitar. Everybody regrets selling their guitar or selling their family car. They want it 30 years later. You want your dad's 58 Chev or whatever he used to have. Mm -hmm. This is a return to, to yesterday. So Talon and I wrote an, uh, an album. Yeah. That's all, the, all of these COVID feelings. And it's called Shadows of Yesterday. And right. it's thinking about how much, how, how much the, the good old days were, how great they were. With, we, the, with, the comp with the government, our health, being alive, having a gig, your old guitars, your old friends, your old family and everything. So in the middle of it, we've got this album coming out that's going to be the soundtrack to the movie, which is going to be called Lost and Found, The Magical Guitar. Because when I got this guitar on it, I wrote and played these eyes laughing she's come undone no sugar tonight no time american woman let it ride hey you taking care of business you ain't seen nothing yet four-wheel drive on and on and on mm -hmm. this was my magic guitar when it was stolen in 76 the magic was gone you could call it my my member dumbles magic feather my magic feather my silver bullet my excalibur this was my connection to the world was this guitar and yeah. then to get back it's going to be it's going to mean so much to me it's mm -hmm. going to be incredible. just a quick question on um yeah you you touched on something that's uh, huge yeah everybody want, needs in the last two and a half years some kind of a uplifting story in this you know i mean because the news is just disgusting but how did you get somebody to authenticate literally that it was your guitar and not <laughs> modified i saw it well, I mean, you can see it, but I mean, the guy who did it did facial recognition. He okay. Took my guitar, on my guitar, there was a little knot. Do you know what a knot is? Gretchen said, "This is made out of plywood." Yeah, no, I I know what you're saying. I play guitar, so there was a knot in the wood. So plywood, when you have it, and there's like a branch, you put a little knot in there. It's either yeah. round like a dime, or yeah. it's like a little, it's a little oval shaped thing. And it, it's part of the beauty of the guitar because plywood has great grain in it. But the top of your guitar. Mm. It's really great. So mine has a little round dot there. Yeah. So he did facial recognition of mine from looking at for number one. He took Takeshi on Rock and Run the Christmas Tree, which is what he was singing. It was a Christmas show. And he put my guitar next to his, and I said, that's my guitar. Wow. And I got fearful. I was like, wow, here's my guitar. After searching for 50 years, every store and every guy and every collector in North America and England and Europe that shows up in Japan. So I know he's got my guitar. And he told me the serial number. Wow. The serial number. I had it insured. Has so then there... I find its sister guitar made in the same week and the serial number is four or five digits off. And it looks the same, except it just doesn't have the little flaw thing right there. But I'm going to go and trade it back. That's awesome. Has there been an investigation on um, the, the place he purchased it from and how they got it? Well, we're doing that. We're doing the backstory. He got it from a vintage guitar in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. We bought it from the Dallas Vintage Guitar Show. We mm -hmm. bought it from the Michigan Detroit Guitar Show. Mm -hmm. I don't know who stole it or when? I know it was stolen from the Holiday Inn. Yep. Um, wow. That's about all we can do. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, I mean, the bottom line is you're getting your guitar back, and and that's just that's just great. Um, um, I just want to ask you a quick thing. Um, <laughs> I'm a big Simpsons fan. Everybody knows that. When you were asked uh, to do the Simpsons, um, how did you how did you feel? Were you a fan before? Or I was a fan. Yeah, I was a real fan. I loved it. Uh, when I saw other shows like with Mick Jagger on or Alice Cooper, I thought, "Gee, why can't that be me?" The Foo Fighters. Then, yeah. Then a yellow page or paper came out of my fax machine saying, "Can we use?" taking care of business and ain't seen nothing yet on the Simpsons. Yeah. But what do you, what do you want to use it for? Like a high school dance with Lisa at a dance or something or Brett Bart Simpson at a dance? No, no, you're going to be on the show. Wow. I said, oh, okay. And they said, fly on down here. Uh, so fly on down. You do a voiceover. We're going to fly Fred in for a voiceover. We don't want you at the same time. Yeah. You will be doing this alone because yeah. if you try to do it with a cast, you will be awestruck. Yeah. You'll be, you'll be sitting at a table with, Mad Marge's voice and Bart's voice. Harry Shearer. People are just normal people. Yeah. But when the voice comes out of them, Yardley Smith, I think, was the uh, Marge Simpson's voice or, or her sister's. So you'll be doing it alone. 
So mm-hmm. I go in there alone. They say, okay, go out and just like vinyl tap, say, hello, Cleveland. But you're saying hello, wherever the Simpsons are from. I can't even remember that. Springfield. Huh? Springfield. Oh, yeah. Hello, Springfield. So I go, hello, Springfield. They go, well, that's great for one person. How about 20 people? So I go, hello, Springfield. Okay, now for 200. And then they go, 20,000. I go, hello, Springfield. It's like it would be 20,000 people. Yeah. And then I do it and I come home. And then they get Fred Turner and he does his. And then they send you a clip and they send you a cell where yeah. they drop you on the cell and then you're on The Simpsons. But they were really, really like family. They were incredible. Mm-hmm. At Christmas time, I got a giant box of thousands of dollars worth of Simpsons merch. T-shirts, uh, games, T-shirts, all kind of merch and swag. It was really incredible. Then I got invited to The Simpsons when they premiere they premiere a new series every every uh, September yeah. at the House of Blues in LA, and I was invited down to that. They pay your way down. They treat you like your Elvis. You got a limo here, a limo there. Everything is done for you. It was really fantastic. So I had really great memories. Then I asked for my script, and so Matt Groening autographs the script, and he you know he draws Bart on it and things like that. And uh, well, I have great memories of that. I have a big box full of Simpsons merch. I love that show. I mean, it's it's one of the most outstanding shows to last. I interviewed Harry Shearer um, yeah. because of his link with uh, Spinal Tap, the movie. Right. Interesting segue, Vinyl Tap, Spinal Tap. But yeah, he was great. Um, before I let you go, man, uh, you've been so gracious this Sunday morning in, uh, in uh, BC. It's 10 o'clock your time. Um, I interviewed a, a heavy rocker from... Uh, Southern Ontario, everybody knows uh, Brian Vollmer from Helix, and it was quite interesting. I'm interviewing him because I'm a fan of his, and he tells me he was trying to get you on his podcast, and I mentioned to him, you know, kind of tongue-in-cheek, I said, well, I'm waiting to hear back from the uh, the Bachman team I've been on for a couple of years. If I get on uh, and interview Randy, I'll, uh, I'll say hi, and I'll put in a good word for you. So here's my good word. Brian Vollmer is a good guy. Great. Thank so, you. Um, okay, so uh, Vinyl Tap is um, on, where Where would people go to, um, do you go to your website and can you link on to the show from your website? Nope, they've got to go to the classic rock station yep. in whatever city they're in and just turn it on Sunday night. Do you know which, uh, oh, so, okay, do you know what cities that are hosting it right now? Um, well, whatever courses, it's one, it's classic rock, 101 in Toronto, yep. 107, 101 in Vancouver, Calgary is 103. It's all the 10 classic rock stations. Right. There's 16 of them right across the country. And there's other little indie indie rock stations that are even AM that are carrying the show. They all call me and say, we want the show. We put it up, they download it, and they play it. Right. Um, two more quick things. Um, first of all, where would people send an email for their ideas for your, um, for your themes? Because I've got a few myself. What's the website uh, they would or email address for that? Mail at randysvinyltap.com. Okay, I'll put that link underneath. And, uh, oh, by the way, what's the opposite of unsubscribe? Subscribe. Do Randy says. He's a legend and he knows what he's talking about. Subscribe to the channel so you get great interviews with cats like Randy Randy Bachman here. And uh, once again, thanks for your time and, uh, and have a great day. Thank you, you too. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Keep the rock rolling. In Sault Ste. Marie. In the Sioux. Right on. Maybe we'll get you here sometime. My bass player's from there. Is that right? Well, we'll have to get... Yeah, Mick Della Vincenza. He's the Della Vincenza family from from Sault Ste. Marie. Well, we've got more Italians, and uh, we love them, so that's great. So I'll have to send a link to uh, to him as well. So that's uh, that's great to know, Randy. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We'll be right back.